Hello everyone, my name is Daniel and I'm a programmer and an artist. And last week we took a look at implementing some ant simulation using simulation nodes. And so all week I was thinking of there were other sort of algorithms that would be interesting to try. And yesterday I made an attempt at doing wave function collapse with geometry nodes, or with simulation nodes rather, um, which I was able to get working pretty seamlessly um, in two dimensions. And then this is the result of my three-dimensional attempt, which is far from perfect, but I think it's mostly from um, missing, well, it's either from trying to make too complicated of a scene, or it's because it's missing parts that it needs to be able to solve every possible solution. It's not true wave function collapse, because in a real implementation, before adding a piece to the solution, it would check to make sure that that change wouldn't, somewhere down the line, um, create a position where there was no valid solution, um, sort of like you can imagine like solving a Sudoku puzzle. I couldn't think of a way to do all of that. Um, so instead, it only knows about the current slot it's trying to fill with a mesh, and um, it doesn't consider the implications that might have on not being able to fill that spot later. Also, when you're actually solving, you always try to solve the cell with the least possible options, and I couldn't think of a way to implement that in this either. So instead, it expands outwards from the center. Um, so here's the 2D implementation, and this is what the node tree for that looks like. I don't think I'm going to go through it node by node because that would um, take a long time. But I'll go through sort of the sections and what each part of it is attempting to do, and then I'll upload the file again if you want to go through and check out how, how it works specifically. So you can see here the result of the first step. Um, this is a two-dimensional piece, if we view this. You can see it selected this piece, and then it's just extruding it down to make it three-dimensional at the end here. Um, the icospheres represent open nodes. So what the simulation node is doing here is every time you advance a frame, it's going to take one of those open nodes and remove it, and in its place it'll spawn all of the possible pieces that could go there. Then it will compare the edges of those pieces to the edges of all of the adjacent pieces, remove all of the ones that are incompatible because they have different vertex counts and stuff, and then of the remaining ones, which should all be valid options, it will pick one at random. Um, and then it will join that into the mesh, and it will find the adjacent squares and add new open nodes there. And you can see that working here for adding pieces. So if you run it, it looks like this. It sort of makes a weird maze shape. So this is the result you get after running it. It's kind of interesting, makes sort of a maze kind of deal. If we select it and make a different seed, or um, if you go to the modifier and change change the seed, um, then you'll get a different shape. Um, I think what I want to do is actually go over the three-dimensional one in a little more depth because it's more interesting. So I'll just kind of briefly point out here we're just picking the points, the open, from the open points we're trying to pick ones that are closest to the center. Here we're picking a random open point. Um, here we're picking all, or we're combining all of our meshes and we're spawning them. Actually that's there. And then here this node is um, getting a value that represents sort of the unique edge that that piece has. And then um, here we're getting the unique edges for the, the adjacent squares. And then all of this logic is comparing those edges and trying to find ones that match. And then that's used here to separate out and um, only select the ones that work. Or maybe here we're picking a single one that works. I don't remember. And then um, after that, we find new squares that are adjacent to it to add to the open list. And we're going to add all of those. Then we're going to remove any that are um, overlapping where the mesh is. And then those go into the open points and the mesh somewhere gets, um, I think, I guess here, the mesh gets merged into the map, and that gets output as the mesh, and then that goes into a loop. So that's the parts and the steps of it. Um, I think I'll leave it at that for the two-dimensional one. All right, so then for the 3D one, I went a different route, and I made all of these sort of scaffolding parts. Um, I was trying to think of other ways you could use it besides making like a kind of a weird maze. I added some additional controls to this one. Um, so rather than just picking from a collection, I put the parts in multiple different collections. And then over time and for different elevations, it picks from different sections. So like the feet are these pieces that have these 
bases to them. Um, it'll it's more likely to pick those, or will only pick from those when you get down low, and then if you get up too high, it starts only picking from these ones that cap and don't go any higher. So if we run this, it looks like this just builds RAM scaffold. You can see it has. You can see here where it has trouble. Um, so this was a valid piece to put underneath here because it matches the beams match up, but the uh, continuation from there doesn't really make sense. I don't think there there must not be a piece that goes here. So then what I have is I have this. Node group here, which if we snap it to the grid right here, will create what is going on. This will create a um, outline that matches the edges there, so then you can convert that to a mesh. And you could take this and you could make another piece that would fit there. The only problem with that is I don't know how you sort of control it so that you are reducing the number of branching possibilities. Um, rather than just creating more trails. So this node graph here is similar to the two-dimensional one. Once again, here we're picking closest to the center, uh, is prioritized as far as open nodes. Here we're picking a random open node. Um, here we're spawning all of the instances to choose from. Um, depending on the situation, like if we're at negative 2z, it's going to pick a base. If we're higher than some value, in Z, it's going to pick a top. Um, all of that could be simplified to just plug a collection into this socket here. Um, to simplify things, rather than, whereas with the 2D one, I had, um, for the two-dimensional one, I have this part, and then I rotated it three times to make all the variations. Um, so rather than doing that manually, for the three-dimensional one, I take the instances here, and I rotate them all on the Z-axis four times. Then, um, since we have to convert it to a mesh, we capture the index of the instance because um, we're going to make it a mesh and we need to be able to reference that later. So then later, after we have chosen or considered all of the options and reduced the set to the possible options, we'll use that same index value. We'll sample it off of a vertex um, and then delete all of the vertices that don't match the index or that don't have an index that match the index of the randomly selected vertex. Uh, minor downside to that is a mesh with a high vertex count is more likely to get selected than a mesh with a low vertex count, but um, this might be another way to randomly pick a mesh after you've... You can't... So in the two-dimensional one, I use the mesh island, but I wanted to remove the limitation of all of the parts of the mesh needing to be connected which is why I did it this way. So then the meat of the whole thing is this mess right here. So it's responsible for s selecting sort of the boundary and comparing that to all of the pieces that we might want to put in that spot and seeing if they match or not. So the way that works is we have, um, we select an open node. So let's see, where are we here? So here we're adding this piece right here. So we have an open node, we select it. First thing we want to do is move the entire mesh so that it's at the center, because that just simplifies everything. So we're going to do that. So you can see now that open node we selected is at zero, zero. Then we have this group here, um, get boundary. And what it does is it removes everything that's not up the boundary. That's the same as this node we had on the icosphere for uh, making a new piece kind of also uses that node. So if this was a more complicated piece, let's just go back so we find... So here's a little better example. We, um, You can see here we have some shapes on the bottom that need to be matched and some shapes in the negative x direction that need to be matched. So then what we do is we take all of our instances, which come in here, we have this monstrosity, all of the parts stacked on top of each other. We're going to run those through get boundary, um, and that looks like this. You can see some of them where the meshes go all the way across, the faces remain, but but it's primarily just keeping the edges that are on the boundaries of the that one by one by one cell. 
So then what we have to do is all of these options would be invalidated because only two sides, the bottom and the negative x direction, were in the what we're trying to match. But obviously this includes all of the sides, um, four of which need to be removed. So what we'll do is we'll take the we'll take a look at the closed points. So I mentioned earlier that in the two-dimensional one there is the concept of open points. There's still the concept of open points, but once we've resolved the point, we now add it to a new set of points, which I call the closed points. And we use the closed points to check which adjacent voxels to the one that we're trying to spawn a mesh in already contain a mesh that would have a boundary. And if there's not a closed point in an adjacent space, then we will remove all of the edges that border that space because they don't matter and shouldn't be considered because there's nothing there yet. So that's what this node here, de delete open sided does. It um, deletes all of the edges from the sides that are open in uh, the space that we're filling. And you can see here that comes from back here, it's the closed points. So after deleting all of the sides that aren't ones we're considering, we're left with this result here. And all of the vertices in this mesh have are tagged with the index of the instance that spawned them. That's important. Because obviously we've destroyed our mesh now, we can't spawn this mesh. We need to have a way to reference from the original set that we created back here. We need to go back to this set to spawn it. So then all of this here is... Um, just to preview and test stuff. All right, I cleaned up a bit because I had a bunch of viewer nodes in there for looking at different pieces and stuff. What we're left with actually looks a lot simpler than it did before, even though it's doing the same thing. So what we're doing is we're um, grouping by that index value that we captured, which is the index of the instance. And we're using that index value to group and accumulate field node where the value that we are accumulating is the distance that each point in the instances that we're considering spawning is from our original boundary that we calculated for the voxel we're trying to fill with a, a mesh. So if the distance between an instance's boundary and uh, the boundary of the total mesh comes down to zero, then we know that they're a perfect match. Um, so then what we do is I separate the geometry where I keep um, only the instances that work. So you can see here we found one because this looks identical to this. But this is the mesh, the mesh that we are have created so far, boundary surface on that, and this is a boundary surface on a mesh that we're considering spawning, and they're a perfect match. So then once we know that, we select a random vertex from this result here, and we sample the index value on it. Then we go back to our original instances, the big pile of them here, and we feed that into a separate geometry node where we select only the ones whose index matches the index on the vertex that we selected here from this set. So that way we get back to the entire mesh since we destroyed part of this one to calculate. And that gets us this piece that we've selected. Um, once we've selected that piece, we can just join it into the result here with the join. And then um, we need to separate out of it. It has some vertices here and here, probably. These three or four points that need to be added to the open list. So we're going to add those. Then we're going to compare the proximity of those points that we added to the closed nodes. If any of them match, we'll get rid of it because it was spawned from there. And then um, we need to add the open, and then we also need to add the open node that we um, used to the closed nodes because we don't want to add a mesh in the same place twice. So that's sort of the quick summary of it. Um, I'm not going to go through every single node, but hopefully that gives you the general idea of how it works. All right, just as an example of how you could use this for other things, here I have a sphere which I've sliced into different parts, and I've marked the open sides with points, and the blocked sides with these X's. So then over here in the node group, if we duplicate a collection info, and we choose, I put those in a sphere collection, then if we plug our sphere instances into the rotation duplicator that makes copies of it, we'll get all of the possible we'll get all of the variations needed to make a perfect sphere. And then if we run this, it should just make a sphere. 
which is pretty cool. And then if instead we were to go over here and make a second piece here and say do anything we want on anything that's not the boundary. So we could extrude this out. It can even go outside of the bounds. That's fine too. So now we have a variation here. And if we come back, um, we can see I already picked it, but we'll get some parts of the sphere use the normal one and some selected this variation. Um, so hopefully that gives an idea of how you could modify it to make your own custom randomly generated whatever. All right, so hopefully that was interesting and another cool node tree that makes stuff. I'll go ahead and upload this file with all of my sort of tests in it to my Blender experiments page. Um, I still feel like it needs work before it's really usable, or maybe I just haven't figured out the right types of meshes to make with it yet, but um, I don't think it's perfect by any means, so don't expect it to do anything crazy. Um, and other than that, I've got my nose and stuff on Gumroad. Check out all the stuff over there if you haven't. And otherwise, that's all I've got for this one. Thanks for watching.